When we looked at the B preface, we came across this famous passage where Kant likens his own philosophical revolution to the ideas of Copernicus. Right, and to reread the beginning of that passage, it goes like this. Up until now, it has been assumed that all our cognition must conform to the objects. But all attempts to find out something about them a priori through concepts that would extend our cognition have, on this presupposition, come to nothing. Hence, let us once try whether we do not get farther with the problems of metaphysics by assuming that the objects must conform to our cognition, which would agree better with the requested possibility of an a priori cognition of them, which is to establish something about objects before they are given to us. So, what does Kant mean when he says that the objects have to conform to our cognition rather than the other way around? This is a fraught question in Kant interpretation. And it's also an important question. Not only does it you know, go to the heart of the critical project itself, but it is very easy to misunderstand Kant here. And some of those misunderstandings will make him look uh, really bad and will make his entire project look really bad. So, for instance, one pretty natural way of interpreting the phrase objects have to conform to our cognition is to believe that Kant is making a pretty insane claim, namely the claim that thinking makes it so, right? The claim that, well, the objects have to be how I think that they are, right? Unlike the normal philosopher who thinks that my thought has to, you know, mirror the object, that my thought has to conform itself to the object, Kant would seem to be saying that it's the object that has to be like my thought. And of course, thinking does not make it so, right? If I think that something is the case, that doesn't make it the case. And of course, that is not what Kant wants to be saying. So what we have to do is we have to think through what this conforming means and what this Copernican revolution can be if we want to, first of all, save Kant from some crude misunderstandings and second of all, get to the bottom of the critical project ourselves. So, what I'm going to do in this video is I'm going to talk about the way that Martin, uh, sorry, Sebastian Gartner, in his Kant and the Critique of Pure Reason, chapter two, uh, interprets the Copernican Revolution. And then in the next video, I'm going to say something about where I think Gartner might be going wrong um, and how I think we, we, you know, other ways we maybe ought to think about the Copernican Revolution. But let's start with, with Gartner's reading. So Gartner's most basic story about Kant's, um, what Kant is doing here consists of two things. First, he introduces a problem, which he calls the problem of reality. And then he introduces Kant's Copernican Revolution as the solution to the problem of reality. And I would say that I absolutely agree with Gartner in, in that strategy, right? Kant himself talks about, well, how do we get a priori cognition of objects? I think Gartner is right when he pushes forwards this problem of reality as the fundamental problem that is being, that is being discussed and that is being solved here. Um, and he's right when he thinks that it's the Copernican revolution that solves it. The question is like where my possible disagreement with Gartner is, is in his interpretation of what the Copernican Revolution amounts to. Okay, let's start with the problem of reality. What is it? Well, how can we know that our thoughts, that our representations of reality um, are actually accurate to reality? How do we know that we ha are in touch with reality, that the kind of things that we think about and that we talk about and that we theorize about and that we believe about are actually the things that exist in reality. Right, this seems to, to believe this, seems to presuppose that our cognitive capacities, our ways of thinking are adequate to the real world. 
And what we would love to know if we are to, you know, not end up maybe in some kind of skepticism or having to accept on blind faith that, oh yeah, sure, uh, let's assume that we can be in contact with reality. Uh, we would like some kind of argument for that. We would like to have some kind of philosophical insight, uh, some kind of guarantee that our ways of thinking are adequate to representing reality. So that is the problem of reality. How can we be sure? How can we know that our ways of thinking are adequate for representing reality? Now, what all philosophical attempts until Kant do when they come up uh, to the problem of reality is, first of all, they presuppose that reality is what is independent of us. And here's the way that Gardner uh, describes it on this on page 35. He says that, you know, all these philosophical attempts until Kant presuppose a world into which the subject is then introduced as a further item. When the subject's eyes are opened and its cognitive functions are in working order, the world floods in and knowledge of the world results. Right? The basic metaphysical picture is there is a world which is independent of us. And then we think ourselves in it. We find ourselves in it. We open our eyes and ta-da we are supposed to be in touch with the world, right? The world is supposed to come flooding in. Um, okay, and so here we have the problem of reality. How do we know that this flooding in ends up with us having representations of reality? Right? How do we know that this is what is going on, that we are the right kind of thing for reality to flow into? Well, all these non-Kantian philosophical systems, according to Gartner, all these, all these forms of what we can call transcendental realism, as opposed to Kant's transcendental idealism, and we'll talk more about that in later videos, all these forms of transcendental realism reduce, and I am again quoting Gartner, reduce on examination to the bare non-explanatory claim that we represent real things because they affect us and because we have an imminent capacity to represent them. Right, so the idea is that they affect us and we just are the right kind of entity to then have representations of reality. But there's no further story there, there's no further explanation there. Transcendental realism, like the systems before Kant, according to Gardner, just don't really even try to answer the problem of reality. They can't deal with it. Okay, now Kant does want to deal with it. So Kant is asking a question that is in a sense more fundamental than the question that is being asked, that the questions that are being asked by uh, his predecessors. And Kant's answer is supposed to be the Copernican turn or the Copernican revolution, right? And he doesn't use those phrases himself, but you know, it's, it's the kind of change, the kind of revolution that he describes in the passage with which we started this video. What is this Copernican turn? Well, again, here is Gartner on page 38. Uh, he tells us that what the pre-Copernican systems assume, they assume a domain of objects which are conceived as having being and a constitution of their own, a class of real objects, right? So what we have is a reality that is independent of us. That is what we have to change, right? We don't have to think about this reality that is independent of us, which we then have to come to know if that's what we try to do, the problem of reality is unsolvable. What is the alternative? Again, I quote Gartner, the alternative is to make an absolute separation between the assumption that there is such a thing as reality and the conception of objects which we are capable of cognizing. Right, and cognizing here is something like, like knowing, like thinking about it, having objective knowledge about it. So what, what Gardner suggests is that what Kant wants to do is to make an absolute separation between the notion of reality on the one hand and the notion of an object on the other hand. Right, the objects of our cognition are by the tradition assumed to be reality, right? this independent reality that's out there. That's what we have to cognize, what we have to try to get knowledge of, what we have to represent accurately. According to Gartner, Kant is going to reconceive objects. 
objects are not the real, there's an absolute separation between those. Um, no, instead we are going to think about objects for us, right? Objects for us, if you want like little dashes between that, that's okay. Objects dash for dash us, objects for us, which are to be understood not in terms of reality, but which are to be understood in terms of knowability. So in epistemological terms, um, an object for us is just the kind of thing that we can know about, that can be given to us, that we can take up in our knowledge, the kind of thing that we can know about. So where pre-Copernican philosophy thinks of objects in terms of the real, the Copernican philosophy of Kant thinks of objects in terms of knowability, right? The objects are just the stuff that we can know about. So Kant assimilates knowability and objecthood, and that is what is going to save us from all kinds of skepticism. Because as long as the objects are the real, the question of how we can know anything about objects and whether we can know anything about objects is a very serious question. But if the objects are the knowable, if we define objects in terms of their knowability, then the skeptical worry that maybe we can't have knowledge of objects can't even be stated. I mean, can't be stated without getting into a flagrant self-contradiction, right? Maybe the knowable is unknowable. That doesn't make any sense. So this is going to save us from skepticism. Um, and here we can see how the Copernical, Copernican reversal is supposed to work, right? Suppose that S, the subject, knows O, the object. In traditional philosophy, we have to think of it like this. The object is affecting the subject. Right? It's making the subject conform. Right? It's pushing something through my eyes into my brain so that my beliefs conform to this object. Kant reverses this. It is the subject that puts something in the object. It's the subject that, you know, sort of pushes something, shapes, forms, constitutes the object. Here again. So there's like, like if there was in the traditional story an arrow from the object to the subject, now there seems to be a kind of arrow from the subject to the object. Um, that's the reversal. And here's the way that, that, that Gartner uh, uh, talks about this on page 41. He says, the constitution of objects is thus determined at the most fundamental level by the subject. And it is a corollary of this pattern of explanation that the subject is active in knowing objects. The subject executes the activities from which the world originates. Uh, again, quoting Gardner, the subject constitutes its objects. It maintains, furthermore, that these subject-constituted objects compose the only kind of reality to which we have access. Right? So we constitute the objects, and this is the only kind of reality to which we have access. That is what the Copernican philosophy maintains. Okay, so if a skeptic comes to us, what we'll have to say to him, if we are Kantians, is... Okay, you're right. We cannot know reality, and I'm using Gardner's terms here, we cannot know reality in the strong sense, right? Because what we know are objects, and objects are not defined in terms of reality, but in terms of knowability. So we can't know reality in the strong sense. You're right about that. But what we can know, once we have taken this Copernican turn, is reality in the weaker sense which is precisely these objects understood as the knowable. If this is the right way to interpret Kant, or if this is the right way to interpret Gardner also, but, you know, I think it is. Uh, if this is the right way to interpret Kant, I think Kant is in serious trouble. Um, and in part for that reason, I don't think this is the entirely right way to interpret Kant. And I want to talk about that in the next video.